Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Migration Speaker Series event, a conversation with Dr. Ming Su Chen on her book, Pursuing Citizenship in the Enforcement Era. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Vanessa Olkin. I am a junior in the College of Arts and Sciences, majoring in government and the interdisciplinary college scholar program, and minoring in migrations. I'm um, I'm a part of the inaugural cohort of Migration Scholars, a fantastic group of undergraduates passionate about migrations research and collaborating with the Migrations Initiative. Thank you to eCornell and to Cornell University's Migrations Initiative for hosting this discussion, which is part of a larger speaker series called Reimagining Citizenship. The Interdisciplinary Initiative studies how all living things migrate from place to place on our planet, and you can engage with more of this work through upcoming activities this semester, including a film series with Cornell Cinema and a new podcast called Migrations, A World on the Move. More information about all of these programs, including the next event in this series, can be found at migrations.cornell.edu slash learn. As we begin today's program, I would like to first acknowledge the land on which many of us are on here today. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayo Cojono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayo Cojono are, are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gayo Cojono dispossession and we honor the ongoing connection of Gayo Cojono people past and present to these lands and waters. This acknowledgement does not exist in the past tense or historical context, but with the recognition that colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Shannon Gleason, the moderator for our event today, who will be introducing Dr. Ming Su Chen. Professor Gleason is Associate Professor of Labor Relations Law and History at the Cornell Industrial and Labor Relations School. She earned her PhD in sociology and demography from the University of California, Berkeley, and was previously on the faculty of Latin American and Latino Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her recent books include Building Citizenship from Below, Precarity, Migration, and Agency, published by Rootledge in 2017, as well as Accountability Across Borders, Migrant Rights in North America, published by University of Texas Press in 2019. Thank you, Vanessa. I really appreciate that very generous introduction. And it is my great pleasure to be here and to be in conversation with my friend and colleague, Dr. Ming Shu Chen. Um, she is an associate professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where she is a faculty member at the law school. And she also is a faculty director of the Immigration and Citizenship Law Program with various affiliations on campus. Um, she is a fantastic person to have here today because like the spirit of our migrations initiative, she brings an interdisciplinary perspective to the study of immigration, civil rights, and the administrative state. And you can find her really rich offering of classes at the CU Law School. But she also has research on citizenship that is bridging both the law as well as social science. And she is writing about this in her new book, Pursuing Citizenship in the Enforcement Era, which has been published by Stanford University Press. And I'm really happy to have her here today to talk. So I will turn it over to her to give us um, an overview of the key themes of the book. And then I'm looking forward to being in conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Shannon. And what Shannon didn't mention is indeed friends and colleagues for goodness, more than a decade now. So it's, it's really a pleasure to be able to come share the book with you and in particular to be in conversation um, with Professor Gleason about the book. So the, the book is titled Pursuing Citizenship in the Enforcement Era. And it starts with a central question, which is why immigrants are pursuing citizenship um, and why specifically now? Um, you see, in an average year, only about half of those who are eligible for citizenship actually apply. But over the last four years, that percentage has risen almost 10%. And whether or not we think that this is a good thing and how we understand why this is happening um, are, are really the motivation for this book. So to give you an overview of how the book is structured, there are essentially three chunks. Um, the first part of the book describes the situation um, that we're currently in and how it is 
that the um, binary version of immigration produces the kinds of citizenship inequalities um, that I'll be talking about. Um, the second part of the book is the fun part. Um, those are the stories of immigrants that were gained um, with interviews, um, many in Colorado, but also all over the country in many different legal categories. Um, and then the third piece, which I will touch on in the presentation, but I'm happy to carry into Q&A, um, is about how we move forward, um, which is, you know, a, was an interest of mine throughout the book. Um, and now that we are in a new presidential administration is something that I imagine um, a lot of people have on their mind. So let me start with the first part of the presentation, um, which is how we got here. So I think many people think about immigration as being a legal binary. Um, and the choices are that you're either a citizen or you're an immigrant and you're legal or you're illegal. Um, and then that makes you an insider or an outsider. And usually the U.S.-Mexico border is considered the dividing line. But that binary is oversimplistic um, and it's rather incomplete. And so what I try to do in the book is to give you a fuller sense of what citizenship looks like. Now, first on the legal status piece, those of you who are familiar with immigration law know that the reality is immigrants come to the United States in many different ways. Um, and they live here in many different statuses, and some become citizens and some don't. Um, so, for example, um, immigrants might come to the United States in one of these pathways that leads them to be a green card, um, sometimes shorthanded as LPR or lawful permanent resident, and that gives them the possibility of going on to citizenship. There are other immigrants who come on a temporary visa, um, some of whom will be able to adjust and follow that same pathway of getting a green card and becoming citizens. Um, others won't. And individuals who come without documents who will have a very difficult time being able to move up this pathway to citizenship. Um, so that's what I call the law school version of understanding immigration. And it is already much more complex than the common view. Um, but what I try to do in the book is also to go beyond formal citizenship, um, to consider the substantive aspects of what it means to be included in the United States. Um, and in keeping with many sociologists who study immigrant integration, um, I look at four different dimensions. Um, first, the social dimension of citizenship or social belonging, um, things like whether a person feels that they are connected in their neighborhood or whether they feel that they are discriminated against. Um, I also look at the economic dimensions of citizenship, so whether someone feels like they have a good job or if they have um, a chance of a good future for their family. And then finally, I look at political citizenship, um, and this essentially is about feeling that your voice is heard and that it matters in the United States. So the way that I studied these questions, um, as I mentioned, was, was significantly through interviews. There are about 100 immigrants um, that I interviewed for this book, um, and they follow roughly these four categories. Um, those who have high levels of formal citizenship are on this side. Um, those are often the green card holders um, or those who have not only a legal status, but an ability to eventually become a U.S. citizen. Um, and then you'll see through the stories that some of those individuals are higher or lower in substantive citizenship in terms of social, economic, and political integration. Um, and then on the other side of the chart, we have those who are lower in formal citizenship, and again, with some variation um, in terms of their substantive citizenship. Um, so let me bring this chart to life um, by telling you just a few of the 100 stories. Um, and what I'll try to do is to pick one to illustrate each of the four boxes here so that you can get a flavor um, of what the rest of the interviews looked like. Um, so the, the image that I have here um, at the bottom um, is an image of Salvador Hernandez. Um, and he is a community organizer in Colorado um, who works with Mi Familia. Um, and they run citizenship workshops on a monthly basis uh, where they help those who are already eligible for citizenship um, complete the form that they need to fill out, which is called the N-400. Um, and Salvador told me um, that at many of these workshops, the immigrants who were turning up and standing in longer and longer lines um, had been eligible for 10 or 15 years. Um, most of them were not showing up on the first day they were eligible. And that really raised the question, not only about why they wanted to pursue citizenship, but why they wanted to pursue it now in this particular moment between 2017 and 2020, when we saw that 10% increase. 
Um, and the stories that I heard um, resoundingly said that the reason that green card holders were coming forward um, is simply because they felt like they couldn't be non-citizens anymore. Um, that in the political climate that we had and with the raft of anti-immigrant policies, uh, they felt they needed the protection of citizenship in order to feel safe um, or to feel secure in the United States. Um, an even more extreme version of this lower substantive belonging uh, might be the refugees that I studied in the stories, um, in the interviews, um, who felt that they might be uh, always a refugee, never American, even though refugees as a whole actually do naturalize at much higher rates than the general population. Now, this is not the same story or experience that everybody has. Um, there is a much larger category of immigrants um, like Bob Marshall um, here, who is a professor at the University of Colorado where I work. Um, now, Bob is a Canadian immigrant. Um, he came to the United States initially as an international student. And then over time, he got a green card when he married a U.S. citizen. Um, and when I met him, he had been eligible for citizenship for about 20 years. Um, but he had never really felt a need to naturalize. Um, and the reason was, and these are his own words, he said that he felt that he was an invisible immigrant, um, essentially that people wouldn't have known that he was an immigrant, um, given his skin color, his fluency in English, um, his relatively privileged economic status. Um, but what was interesting is the same day that we were having coffee, Bob told me that after 20 years of eligibility, he had actually filled out a draft of the N-400, that form that you need to become a citizen. Um, and he was still deciding whether or not he should turn it in. Um, as it turns out, he, he still has not become a citizen. Um, but the reason that he was thinking about it in that moment, um, I think, is very similar to what immigrants like Salvador and those that he was working with were experiencing um, and that is to say that when there were policies like the Muslim travel ban that came in 2017, it became a wake up call to all green card holders, to all immigrants, um, even those who were not targets of the Muslim ban, um, such as those from Canada, like Bob, um, or those from Mexico, like Salvador. Um, they also were not targets for deportation. So this deportation machine, the heavy enforcement, was not a direct threat to them as green card holders, and yet it still served to make them feel less secure in the United States. So the lesson of the stories um, on of formal citizenship um, are in many ways a story about the limits of the law. Um, all of these immigrants were on a path to formal citizenship, but they had a range of substantive experiences. Um, many of them felt a form of citizenship insecurity um, that went anything from their um, experiences as immigrants of darker skin colors who might then be grouped with other disfavored minorities, minorities in the United States, um, or the refugees, um, as I mentioned, who felt that socially uh, and culturally that they were very distant. Um, and this, in part, is the explanation um, of the rising trend. Um, of defensive citizenship um, and the idea that immigrants felt that citizenship had become a strategy for their own protection. Now, let me turn to the other side of the chart. And this side is actually much more varied. Um, so again, I'm just giving you slivers of the stories um, out there. Um, but as I, as I mentioned on the, um, on the lower side of formal citizenship, um, there are those who still experience high levels of substantive belonging, even though they lack legal status. Um, and then there are those who, um, as, as might be more understandable, um, lack both substantive belonging and formal citizenship. So I won't spend a lot of time on this block because I'm guessing many of you who are tuning into a Migrations Initiative um, series are probably familiar with the story of dreamers. Um, but as one example, um, the idea here is, is summarized very much in this, this magazine cover. Um, it is the idea of feeling American, having been in the United States from a very young age, having English be a predominant, if not a primary language, and having spent one's life in American schools. Um, and yet, the asterisk um, is that many of these individuals felt that they were Americans, just not legally. Um, and Gabrielle was one of the students I spoke with who said 
she originally thought that she could be in DACA or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival status forever. Um, and that contributed to her sense of belonging. It was just a piece of paper um, and didn't really change anything um, about her lived experience. But after a variety of policy changes, um, including the attempted rescission of DACA in 2017, she felt that she realized that nobody was secure and she couldn't count on DACA or the promise of a DREAM Act um, to feel secure. And the other stories, this is actually a very, very category, um, but these are individuals who came to the United States on temporary visas. Um, and at the University of Colorado and Cornell and many other universities around the country, um, the largest number of international students um, are from China, and many of them are coming in STEM-related disciplines. Um, so as, as one example, um, there was an immigrant I interviewed um, named May, um, and she talked about feeling that her time in the United States, while relatively pleasant, um, was, was just time that she was spending as a guest. She didn't feel in any sense that she was part of the university's community or part of the national community. Um, and when I asked her if she were ever to become eligible for a green card, which she wouldn't on the international student visa that she had, but if she could imagine that future, would she want to become a citizen? Um, and she said that she really wasn't sure. Um, she said it might be nice to have a green card. Um, that would probably help her find a job. It might make it easier to travel back and forth to China. Um, but whether or not she wanted to take that next step, um, she was pretty ambivalent. Um, she said that it essentially just depended um, on a weighing of costs and benefits. Right? So she had this very thin sense of citizenship and belonging, despite the fact that many people think about international students and high-skilled workers who come in similar visa categories um, as being in a position of privilege. Um, their experience of being in the United States um, substantively can be quite hollow. So to sum up some of the lessons um, that come from the uh, low formal status um, side of the chart, um, the immigrants that I studied all had either blocked paths to citizenship, like the dreamers, um, or broken paths, um, like international students um, who wouldn't be able to become citizens on their visa, but might have a possibility of adjusting to a more permanent status later on. Um, as with those who had a stronger formal citizenship, there was a mix of substantive experiences. Um, in all cases, whatever level of insecurity they felt was heightened during the years of the Trump administration, where immigrant exclusion and immigrant enforcement were the dominant focus of federal immigration policy. Now, if we look to the images on the bottom, um, there was a turn in the writing of this book. Those of you who have written books know that it takes a lot of years um, to finish them. And I turned to the manuscript for this book in March of 2020. Uh, which means that I turned it in just as the country was starting to realize that COVID-19 is something that we were going to be dealing with as a nation. Um, and when something really big happens, um, you always wonder what it's going to mean for the message in your book. Um, and in this case, fortunately for my research, perhaps not fortunately for the immigrants I interviewed, um, I found that the experience of COVID-19 and the perceptions of a disease following immigrants into the United States and all the corresponding travel bans um, only heightened the sense of citizenship and security that I had found in, um, in the book during my years of research. So um, as one snapshot of that, during the Trump years, there were more than 400 immigrant-related actions, um, and more than 50 of them dealt with COVID-19 itself. Um, so I think many of the experiences that I report on in the book um, are ones that we continue to contend with now. So that does bring us to um, the final picture, um, which is how we move forward. How can we move forward where we are still coping with the COVID-19, um, but we are also presented with some level of promise um, with a new administration that has proposed legislation like the Citizenship Act of 2021. Um, and I would summarize the suggestions that are in the book um, by pointing to these broad principles. First, of making integration the North Star of our immigration policy. 
Um, and that would follow all of the dimensions that I tracked. And so, for example, some of these are things that the Biden administration has already done, um, such as thinking um, socially about the meaning of being a immigrant um, as being a future citizen um, or a future American um, with the shift in language from the um, the government referring to non-citizens as aliens um, instead using the word non-citizen and so as one advocacy group that that I've participated in has said the shift would be from alien to non-citizen to citizen um, and that change in language I think signals a change in social belonging um, in addition there are many dimensions of economic um, inclusion um, that would go along with this idea of integration. One of them would be um, a revisit of the public charge rule, um, one that many have thought of as a wealth test for immigrants um, who rely on public benefits that they are legally eligible for, um, but worry about the possibility that will count against them later on when they try to become citizens. Um, and finally, the battles over the inclusion of immigrants in the census um, and whether they ought to instead be excluded um, as formal non-citizens. Um, and, and that is a policy that has already been changed in the Biden administration, but that would be an example of political exclusion. Finally, um, there are a number of ways that we need to uh, move on the formal side of citizenship. Um, and these are more direct policy suggestions to change the paths available. Um, my contention is that they would need to be tailored um, to each of the types of immigrant experiences I talked about. Um, for the green card holders, it would mean having a smoother path to citizenship, um, thinking about things like the citizenship test, the cost of the citizenship application, um, difficulties with language and translation, um, significant backlogs in the U.S. citizenship and immigration services. So smoothing that path would be one way to build um, stronger paths for green card holders, and some of those are addressed in the Citizenship Act of 2021. Um, secondly, for temporary visitors, we need to think about on-ramps, and those could include immigrants such as the ones that I spoke, of, spoke with, um, mostly high-skilled immigrants and international students, um, or it could include many of the essential workers who have shown their significance in the um, during the period of COVID-19 as healthcare workers, um, as restaurant workers, as grocery store workers, um, and as agricultural workers. Um, and so another piece of the Citizenship Act of 2021 um, talks about at least giving them what they call blue cards in order to stabilize their status, and then the greater possibility of being able to adjust to a green card status in recognition of the service that they had given to the United States. And finally, for undocumented immigrants um, to think about a way to create a path to citizenship um, that doesn't exist. And that has probably been one of the headlines of the proposed legislation. So I'll pause there um, and I'm happy to continue the conversation first with Professor Beeson and then with the rest of you who are out there. Thank you, Ming. This is a really fantastic overview of a book. I really commend it to everyone. Um, and I just want to remind the group that if you want to ask a question, which we'll be incorporating in a bit, you can click on the chat icon um, on the Zoom portal. So please do weigh in with whatever questions you may have. We have a lot of ground to cover. And I wanted to start us with um, just revisiting one of the key themes in your book, which is, again, moving beyond these binaries. So much of the policy debate in this country has been at that intersection of undocumented and documented. Um, we know that, for example, 5% of the civilian workforce is undocumented, um, but I would say most of the debates and most of the political discussions are about those 11 to 12 million individuals. But what is missed is what you refer to as the spectrum of citizenship. And so I wanted you to, to talk about that spectrum and how that becomes important, especially in light of the current, what's being referred to as the Biden bill that's being presented before Congress. And if you had a chance to take a look at it, it's a, it's a thick um, set of propositions. But if you could just talk about what, you know, what do we learn by taking this um, perspective of a spectrum of citizenship rather than focusing only on binaries? What might we learn by that? Sure. Um, and yes, it is thick. It's about 350 pages um, in both the House and the Senate versions of the bill. Um, 
Well, I mean, as you said, the headline has been the 11 million undocumented immigrants, but that really just scratches the surface of, I think, what makes this um, proposed leg- legislation pretty bold and pretty ambitious. Um, the idea of the spectrum of citizenship, I think, shows that there are a lot of different facets of immigration, of the immigration system um, that need fixing. And I think people um, across the political spectrum would generally agree with that. Um, And so some of the reforms that are talked about um, would pertain specifically to temporary workers and in particular some of the agricultural workers um, that have been talked about um, in Congress for many, many years um, but have not seen legislative relief. Um, And again, this idea of blue cards, I think, really captures something um, to recognize that uh, many of these immigrants uh, might not immediately be eligible for a green card. It's not going to be that a a magic wand is waved um, in order to immediately grant them um, or even an eight years grant them the kind of citizenship um, that other immigrants might experience, um, but to create even just that possibility. Um, And then similarly, for those who already have those temporary paths, um, to be thinking about ways to model perhaps the H-1B path for high-skilled workers um, that does allow people the potential to live in the present and also envision um, a future in the United States. Um, And then the last thing I would say about is something I I touched on earlier is that in addition to thinking about those formal paths, we really do need to think about the complex experience of immigrants living in the United States. Um, And that does include more than their legal status. It's not going to be just a legal fix. Um, And I think that is going to require a lot of um, support uh, for people's needs socially, economically, um, as well as politically. Um, I wanted to incorporate a couple of the questions that we have rolling in. I think so much of the focus right now has been on the current propositions under the the new administration. But one of our um, audience members asks if you had any thoughts going back to even the Clinton administration and the Jordan Commission. I know this is reaching a ways back, but what I remember of the Jordan Commission, which is a bipartisan committee that was um, chaired by... um, Uh, Texan Barbara Jordan was uh, that it had a more restrictionist approach and it certainly had a big focus on I think what was tagged the tagline there was protecting um, not only diversity but also the local economy and I think that some of the vestiges of that um, tension remain in, in the current legislation. And I just wondered as a more general point, if you had any thoughts about the, the current bill um, and how some of these debates that we have tackled throughout administrations continue and, and what is your research um, tell us about the enduring relevance of those conversations? When I talk with my students um, about comprehensive immigration reform, uh, which became the buzzword um, around the time of the Jordan Commission um, with its recommendations um, to change many different aspects of immigration. Um, The idea is that there's a three-legged stool um, and that there always would have to be political compromises um, in in trying to make significant reform. Um, And so one of those pieces might be to talk about the legal migration system, um, things like the temporary visas and the green cards uh, that I referred to in the book. Um, Another piece would be to deal with enforcement. Um, And a lot of that dealt with enforcement at the border. Um, Some of that also addressed the um, economic issues um, that you refer to, um, most notably the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act um, that created a lot of disincentives um, for immigrants to accept um, work if they didn't have the documents to support it. Um, And then the last piece would be to think about undocumented immigrants who are already in the country. So it had become conventional wisdom that you would need to have all three pieces being worked on. Um, And I think that one of the distinctive features um, of this particular proposal is that it is much more heavy on the integration and legal immigration side. Um, It it would include the pathway for undocumented immigrants. But again, it's really pushing hard on that. On the enforcement side, I think it's a bit more subtle. I won't say it's absent. I think it is subtle um, by talking more about um, things like... um, having some equity and humanity um, in the enforcement regime that we have, um, or even the idea of pursuing um, economic development in um, areas of Central America that have become a significant source of migration to the United States um, as almost a preventative measure for undocumented immigration that comes across the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, But the emphasis assuredly is is more on integration, um, and I think that's notable. And while I'm not 
um, in Congress. I'm not in D.C. Um, my sense is that the reason it's set up that way is because people are envisioning um, a piecemeal strategy to legislative reform where they want to be able to break off these pieces um, rather than have some internal compromises um, where integration almost always falls off the table. Right. And I, my read of the bill, too, is that the more incorporative pieces of it um, do detract from the pieces of the immigration enforcement virus that you talk about that will maybe not be hardened, but not necessarily be softened. And we know this also going back into the Clinton era with some of the um, criminalizing provisions that were put in place. And so I think that will be something that advocates will continue to, to fight on, probably also in a very piecemeal fashion. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I also find really exciting about reading your book is um, some of you may know about before I started my academic career, I spent some time working in a small immigration um, rights clinic. It was a nonprofit in Silicon Valley, helping people do exactly the process that you talk about, which is filling out um, naturalization forms with the iconic N-400. At the time, it was only a couple hundred dollars. Remind us, how much is it now? To um, Right now, it is about 600 um, Yeah. As of last summer, it would have been over $1,000. $1, right. Yeah. So the price has gone up and some of the things um, involved in the bureaucracy perhaps have changed a bit. But I wondered, more than anything, the, the world has changed a lot since um, when I was doing this right at the turn of 2000, 2001. And you talk in the book a lot about the impact that September 11th had, not only in the immigration bureaucracy, but also in terms of the types of barriers that um, individuals who are pursuing citizenship or thinking about the naturalization process are facing. And so I wondered, um, given this, this set of changes, not, in terms, not only in terms of the bureaucracy, but also the world, the reconfiguration of the DHS, et cetera, what would you say are some of the biggest differences that a naturalization applicant that say was in, in my clinic at the time would have faced compared to the folks that you were interviewing? Um, first, let me just say that I really appreciate that you pin the turning point um, to a pre-Trump era. Um, I think that's important because a lot of people think that when I talk about enforcement, I'm only talking about Trump. Um, when I talk about the enforcement era, I'm certainly including Trump, um, but, but it didn't all begin um, with the Trump administration. And that's important to know because it won't all end uh, with the end of the Trump administration. Um, so, you know, what I would say is that um, the challenges of integration um, at the federal level have indeed always been there. Um, but I think they've been heightened, they've been exacerbated um, by a lot of the um, more exclusionary policies. Um, and so if I can get into a little bit of the granular detail, um, one thing that the former INS Commissioner Doris Meissner has said um, is that we need to put the S back in, at that point, the service mission back in the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Or in this moment, you might say, post 9-11, we need to put the S back in the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services to recognize um, that there is a branch of the federal government um, that is meant to uh, see itself as providing a service, um, dispensing immigrant benefits um, like green cards that might allow someone to get to citizenship. Um, and what we've seen over the last four years instead is almost a swallowing up of that integration focus um, by the enforcement mission of the broader Department of Homeland Security. Um, and so, you know, one really significant um, example is that outside this book, I worked on a government report um, for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights about the backlogs in citizenship, um, which have in some cases reached, you know, more than two or three years um, once someone is already eligible to become a citizen. Um, and one of the reasons that that backlog has developed is that the funding for the U.S. CIS has largely been directed to a fraud and detection unit within the U.S. CIS. Right. And so it wasn't that fraud detection didn't exist before, but that's an enforcement mission that's been embedded inside um, the service agency. Um, another example is CARP, um, which is a program that is meant to target those who raise the risk of being um, a national security threat. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll leave to you whether you think it's a coincidence or not, but almost every case that's been flagged um, is for an individual who came originally from a Muslim majority country. Um, and I think that's directly the result 
um, of policies um, stemming from 9-11 um, and this idea of extreme vetting um, that we saw subsequently with the with the um, Trump's Muslim travel ban um, and that that has itself become a roadblock um, for those who would otherwise be eligible um, for citizenship. Yeah, and I think that it's it's really important for us to be engaging in this distinction between what you say is this formal and substantive citizenship. And so much of the work that I, including, do focuses on this changing of the bureaucracy, the actual ability for people to adjust their status, be it into LPR status or in, into citizenship. And a lot of what you're highlighting is what are the racial hierarchies, what are the forms of ethno-religious discrimination into which um, immigrants are incorporating, and what does that mean about their ability to continue to not only pursue well-being, but also some of the other political and civic um, engagement pieces that we tend to, to focus on in terms of the benefits of naturalization. But I wanted to bring this back to some of the conversations we're having, not only in the in the realm of immigration, but also in the broader racial justice movement, which is this, again, this distinction between formal and substantive citizenship. Any Anyone who has studied T.H. Marshall knows that the conversations around citizenship actually began with how we understand, for example, the disenfranchisement of former slaves, Native Americans, and much of the kind of fundamental writing on immigration stems from what do we know about the development of citizenship with these other um, marginalized communities. And so I wondered in the current moment in which we find ourselves and have found ourselves for a long time, um, what opportunities do you see for peeling back um, this this focus, almost hyper-focus on, on formal citizenship, either in terms of legalizing or documenting the undocumented or get out the vote and kind of encouraging people to, to become citizens through that process. And I say this, especially at a time when we are seeing virulent racism against Asian Americans, which the media is not covering. And so I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the um, you know, the heightened awareness around racial injustice, the particular moment we find ourselves in COVID, but even beyond. And what does this kind of breaking apart, this assumption that once you get um, uh, either LPR status, your green card or citizenship, that somehow you're good, <laughs> that you are going to seamlessly um, integrate and be uh, faced with an equal system um, in, in the United States. Can you talk on that a little bit? Yeah, those are such rich questions, um, and some of them are ones that I'm still puzzling over and hoping to um, write about more um, in in my next major project. I, I hesitate to call it the next book, but that might be what it becomes. Um, I do think, you know, one way to understand the takeaway of this book um, is to say that we need to help immigrants pursue citizenship. Right. So it is kind of similar to the legislation that we've been talking about. Um, it is heavily focused on formal citizenship. I don't know why I would say that is hyper focused, um, because I think the message of the book is just a little more nuanced than what I said. Um, I think it's to say that it is necessary to have formal citizenship, um, but that it is not sufficient. Right? And so it is a foundation that I think we need to build on. And if we look at the broader context of citizenship um, for African-Americans, for women, um, for birthright citizens who came from Asia, um, you know, over the arc of the you know, Civil War reconstruction in the late 1800s, um, I think you see a similar trajectory. Right? You have the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment um, abolishing slavery, and then subsequently you deal with um, political incorporation in the 15th Amendment, for women in the 19th Amendment, um, and then many of those battles about economic belonging are still uh, very much um, being worked on, right? Because we still know that we have economic um, disparities that have only been intensified during COVID-19. Um, so that trajectory, I think, in some ways has parallels with what I'm arguing for in the book. Um, I don't think anyone would want to reject formal citizenship if it was available to them. Um, there is a lot of research that shows that there is a citizenship premium um, that shows itself in wage increases um, and certainly psychologically um, in terms of the security people feel as opposed to the precarity that I know you yourself have written about. Um, and I think that is something that is um, true, it is almost endemic to the condition of being a non-citizen, especially when enforcement is strong. Um, your question about Asian Americans, I think, is one that you know is, is very close to my heart, um, and I think also a really important one because I do think that sometimes there is a tendency in America 
um, to think about um, to think about disadvantage as being focused solely on those who um, have the many different interconnected experiences of being of darker skin color um, and of having um, negative experiences with law enforcement um, and taking nothing away from that. I did think it was very interesting to interview immigrants who many would perceive as as quite privileged. Um, Many international students um, wouldn't be able to afford coming to the United States were it not that their family had a a fair amount of economic stability. Um, You know, if we move out of the Asian experience, people like Bob Marshall who are coming from Canada, right? All of these individuals also talked about a sense of insecurity. Um, And so I found that to be really fascinating. Um, and And it did really point out the need to disaggregate those threads of what we think about as disadvantage and what we think about um, as, um, as privilege. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that these multiple interlocking layers of disadvantage operate both simultaneously, but also intersect, right? So xenophobia and the othering that happened to the immigration experience is also very much intersecting with different kinds of experience of racism, right? And so the anti-Blackness that is pervasive in this country um, has a, a generalizing effect But it's also a very particular experience and that there are other forms of exclusion that we want to to understand in that broader context that is the United States. But certainly um, economic mobility in and of itself does not free individuals from those experiences. And the othering that happens with this kind of perpetual foreigner um, Mm -hmm. connotation that many folks um, that you talk to um, feel um, I think is is important for us as both race scholars and immigration scholars. I wanted to pull together a kind of a set of questions that are coming in from our colleagues in the chat. Um, and, and to set this up as questions around both the, the policies and the debates happening around a CIR, comprehensive immigration bill, but also the kind of political realities of bipartisanship. And so Dan Kowalski, who's one of our immigration um, scholars and practitioners, talks about, for example, the very utilitarian conversations that are happening around the benefits that immigrants might bring. Um, Economic demographers uh, have written a lot about what is the impact of migration particularly for federal programs like Social Security and and Medicare. That is both because of the aging population in the United States, something that countries like Italy and, and Japan know a lot about. And so the kind of changing the population pyramid there, but also ironically, the disproportionate number of undocumented folks um, who pay into these systems but don't reap the rewards also mm-hmm. changes the calculus. And so you have that set of questions as the population in the United States is changing, but also as Stephen Yaler, our other immigration colleague, talks about this increasingly polarized set of American politics, including but also way beyond immigration. Um, and so they they both are wondering, how do we tackle these big policy questions? Again, I always, often tell my students immigration debates are happening not in a vacuum, but in the context of all these other conversations we're having, having but also given the highly um, Uh, polarized environment in which we live. And so neither of us are political strategists, but we are observers of of Congress. And so I'm just curious if you have any reflections given given the the perspective you have on the ground in terms of what are some ways forward that just take account of those both economic and demographic realities, as well as the political ones that Steve raises. That's a big question. I mean, I think that one way to move forward, and I don't want this to be misheard, I think one way to move forward is to start with the areas where you can build some kind of political consensus. Um, And so I do think that that is something we're seeing um, with the prioritizing of dreamers. Um, And I know dreamers themselves, who are very thoughtful about these issues, have sometimes talked about not wanting to avail themselves um, of, of political sympathy um, for their situation if it means leaving out others, including their own parents in many cases, um, who would not meet the statutory requirements um, for uh, for going down this pathway to citizenship. Um, And so I think that's one place to start. Um, It's just not where we want to end, right? And so um, I, I think 
one thing to be careful about um, is letting the good be the, letting the perfect be the enemy of the good um, and wanting to see this comprehensive reform just because, and as I mentioned, the vision of the bill is quite ambitious. Um, but when it comes down to turning a vision into actual policy, um, I think there does need to be a willingness to take those incremental steps. You know, um, you know, the reason we had a Civil Rights Act of 1964 is because Brown versus Board of Education didn't take care of everything in 1954, right? So you're not always going to see all of the progress um, in a single step. Um, I, think another way, another, I think thinking about green card holder mm-hmm. is another example, because I think a lot of um, American citizens can see um, their own lives and people in their families and workplaces and schools um, who were once green card holders. And that's where I think this idea of being um, future Americans could be very motivating. Yeah, and just to add on to one of the very good points you made, you know, the policymaking process itself is is its own set of considerations. But as one of our colleagues, um, Elsa Gras, also talks about paying attention to the implementation then of whatever we end up with and the many more actors far beyond um, the, the DC loop that are going to be implicated in that process. And um, I wanted to just take advantage because we're on this point to, to pull in one of the questions from um, a budding immigration scholar, Hunter, who talks about uh, this issue of the kind of the substantive um, and more incorporative approach of local localities, like those that have been dubbed sanctuary cities. Um, and while that, you know, a lot has been written about the, their ability to actually tackle this and enforcement bias of the um, immigration system, he wonders, um, what what do we know about, you know, some of the many things that you're talking about in terms of creating um, these paths to integration, even in the absence of a federal regime that's doing this in a, in a fully funded way? And what has the last administration done to either dismantle some of the progress we've made on that front? Or in my, in my case, I'm wondering also maybe even rejuvenate or demobilize some of the, the local ground up um, efforts in this regard, even in the absence of, of federal reform in the direction that you seem to advocate? Mm-hmm. But I think the role of um, states and localities, um, and I would add to that nonprofits, essentially the role of the non-federal government actors um, has always been a crucial piece of integration and that'll continue to be true um, going forward. Um, We keep referring to the um, proposed legislation, even though it's not the law right now, Um, but again, because I do think in many ways it is a vision document. Um, If you look at the section of the bill that looks at integration, um, a significant piece of it is reallocating funds and resources to states and localities and nonprofits so that they can deliver on the work um, of conducting um, English language courses and job training, um, of working with refugees on resettlement issues. Um, And so it definitely needs to be a partnership um, between the federal government um, and, and other entities that are closer to the ground and closer to the daily experiences um, of, of immigrants. Um, I don't, I, I like the idea of a partnership or even like a hub and spokes kind of image, I think more than seeing this as an either or. Um, again, because I think the federal government and local government have different roles to play in the multidimensional project of integration. Um, and so, you know, as you mentioned, I think a lot of the state and local um, movement has emerged in the gaps where federal immigration policy um, didn't take care of the problem. Um, but I think you would need it anyway, right? Because if you had a path to citizenship for everybody, which is the kind of thing that the federal legislation would usually try to focus on, um, you would still need to think about economic integration um, and social integration and things that are very hard to do from the top down. Um, And so um, in that sense, I I think there are some ways that the challenges that we're dealing with now are enduring challenges. We had them before and we're going to continue to have to work on them. Right. And I think this focus on what localities and both the civic sphere are doing, be it formal nonprofits and philanthropic groups, as um, Elster and I have written about, or grassroots organizers and social movements, that has to be part of the conversation. And it strikes me that those groups, in some cases, are doing the work solely focused on immigrant rights, but more often than not are doing that work in coalition with other forms of advocacy, be it around worker justice or economic precarity, 
Um, you talked a lot about, for example, the public charge rule, which would um, really devastate some of the even thin social safety net opportunities available to even those migrants who have legal status. Um, some of them, but they're also doing this work in the arena to go back to one of our earlier themes of, of racial injustice and, you know, which is one of many forms of social integration. And so, you know, without in mind, I, I wondered, you know, you and I are both um, writing also in the, in the field, in the arena of scholars who do this work on critical race theory. And I, I wondered, I mean, what do you think that the current immigration debates tend to miss or maybe even sometimes willfully ignore about the role, not only of economic precarity, but also race and, and, and racisms, um, things that just legalizing an entire population or naturalizing an entire population don't necessarily get at. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you'd like to see those conversations be um, more in concert with each other. Sure, and, and this is a place where I think I would um, you know, say that this blind spot that exists in, in separating the experiences of immigrants from separating um, experiences of racial exclusion, I think that extends beyond policymakers to, um, you know, frankly, I think we're guilty of it. I think a lot of um, academics do the same thing. And particularly where I'm situated, um, primarily in a law school, I think immigration lawyers and race um, and, and um, race scholars are, are particularly um um, I don't know, particularly guilty of this. And so, you know, as one example, um, one thing I admire about the social scientists is that many of the people who study immigrants also study Latinos and Asian Americans. Um, and that might seem like an obvious move, um, given that Latinos are the largest foreign born population in the United States and that Asian Americans are the fastest growing foreign born population in the United States. Um, but I will say in law schools and in legal scholarship, um, you know, the equality laws that grew out of the Civil Rights Act are a separate set of statutes than the I INA, the immigration statute. And so they're usually taught in different courses. Um, and so I do think that there is often this, this division and this pulling apart um, of issues that are both intertwined conceptually, um, but are literally in intertwined um, in the life of the many immigrants who are simultaneously non-citizens and member of racialized groups. Um, and so that's actually... Um, where I want to go in my next project. I have a tentative title. I just need to write the rest of the book that goes with the title. Um, but it would be this idea of um, colorblind nationalism, um, you know, to understand that um, there is a, a way of blinding ourselves to the racial dimension um, of immigration policy um, when we talk about the border being something that's neutral, right? That the country obviously needs to correct, um, protect its borders, otherwise there wouldn't be a nation unto itself. And that it just so happens that we exclude some people. And if we take this very moment, um, it just so happens that we're excluding um, people who are coming in who might be threats um, for public health reasons. And it just so happens that that public health threat is seen to have originated in Wuhan, China. And it just so happens that we're excluding Asian Americans who have a long history of being excluded that goes back to the late 1800s and laws like the Chinese Exclusion Act. Right? So I think in reality, um, it's not possible to talk about fixing immigration without also talking about racial equality. Um, but I do think sometimes those become separate conversations. Um, and so that even among friends, um, they, there are lost opportunities um, for solidarity in those movements. Yeah, and I think the, the, the things that you raise here, I think, I, for me, situate the academic sphere in which we are all operating as an important part of the visionary conversation, um, not only in terms of future orientation, but also looking backwards to understand where we ended up, the, the process of really denaturalizing these, and, and not the naturalization <laughs> that we're talking about here, but denaturalizing the assumptions we make about how we ended up where we are, and questioning and revisiting the assumptions about how nation states came to be, how borders came to be constructed, how the categories of subject and other emerged. Um, 
And, you know, not to say that these things don't have real life consequences as do racial and gender constructs, mm-hmm. but that they are socially constructed and therefore can be unmade as, as May Nye also talks about. And so I think that this is really important. We had a question in the chat uh, that was part of this visionary conversation of, you know, why, why don't we have um, a space where these constraints of the political um, are, aren't present, you know, a, a not a citizenship free space. It makes me remind, remember if we have any other Berkeley colleagues that that small little space on Sprawl Hall on campus, which is the free speech zone. You know, why is it that we don't really have a space where um, the constraints of citizenship don't don't operate. Why does this is so pervasive, not only in the United States, but everywhere. And I think that those visionary conversations can oftentimes be um, disregarded as not being relevant to the, the here and now, but I think are important for us to not necessarily just get caught up in our, you know, particular domestic politics of, of talking about policymaking. And so I, I appreciate the ways in which we have the privilege to have those conversations, both facing the current political moment, but also thinking about what is the future that we want to co-construct. Um, but I want to go back to methodology because I am an, an empiricist and I want to just make sure that everybody understands the, the work that really went into pulling together the just sampling of stories that you told us today. And it's impressive on a number of different fronts. On the one hand, you pull together these comparative stories of different individuals who are on the citizenship spectrum. And some of these categories of folks are um, perhaps easier to access than others for a whole host of reasons. And so I wanted you to talk about this, especially for those graduate students or other researchers who are listening in who are wondering about how you pull off comparative research um, in a very um, volatile, changing political environment. And so can you talk more about this process of talking to people, which is essentially what you did? Um, I commend to everyone the appendix in, in Ming's book, which lays this out in a very um, uh, accessible way. Um, how, you, how do you go about asking people about their naturalization journey and their intentions and how willing were folks to talk with you and your team? You have a a team of folks you were also working with in these settings. So so can you say something about that? Sure. And I'm I'm smiling because, um, you know, Shannon will know that she was a sounding board on the methodology um, at many moments in this project um, when I was trying to figure out um, how to conduct this study in a way that would create a coherent story and yet also just be true um, to the many varied experiences of the immigrants who are in this book. Um, you know, at a high level, I showed you that two by two grid. I mean, in reality, there were six legal categories that was I was intentionally sampling um, for um, in thinking about what it means to be a non-citizen in the United States. And even with six legal categories, I was very conscious of the fact that I was still leaving other categories out. Um, And, you know, on one end of the spectrum, um, you know, it it would have been interesting to include um, U.S. born citizens, perhaps, or at least naturalized citizens, because, you know, if you're moving up that that chart to the high formal, high substantive, um, that would be a way to to extend that spectrum. Um, But perhaps um, in a way that might be of greater concern, um, the spectrum also could have extended further um, in the direction of undocumented immigrants who don't have the protection of DACA um, or green card holders who had committed a criminal, um, who have a criminal conviction that would make them deportable um, at risk of both losing their green card, but also needing to leave the country. Right. And so um, one of the reasons that that I didn't take those two tails, um, especially the the one over here, um, is because those individuals would be um, much more difficult to interview. Um, I I think that in terms of getting clearance from um, the Institutional Review Board um, and simply being able to um, establish the trust that would be needed um, in a a book process that was relatively quick, um, I think would be very difficult. Um, Again, my my reassurance is that I think the stories that I tell in this book are probably even more true. The story of citizenship and security would be even more true for those who are further down that end of the spectrum. Um, But I do think that um, that that was one piece of it. Um, another thing I'll say is that, you know, in terms of the, um, there were many moments where I felt like I was trying to hit a moving target um, because the immigration policies kept changing. Um, so, for example, I started some of my DACA interviews um, before DACA was rescinded and some of them, um, and then DACA was rescinded and I thought, oh no, like, are these stories still going to be true, right? And then there was litigation that went through the Supreme Court that only last summer got resolved.
go back. Um, and so I, um, to the extent that I was able, I went back to individuals that I had interviewed with shorter surveys um, just to take their temperature and to see if there had been significant developments. Um, and, and similarly um, with the refugees, I have to say that one was really, really challenging. Um, the refugees we interviewed were much more willing to talk to us at the beginning of this process. Um, and after um, the Muslim travel ban, um, after the lowering of the ceiling of refugee admissions, um, after a lot of state resettlement agencies um, had lost funding, um, I found that refugees were a lot more nervous and frankly, their gatekeepers, a lot of their service providers um, didn't really um, want myself or my team of student research assistants um, to, I, I guess, to potentially re-traumatize um, these refugees or in any way put them at risk. Um, and again, I'm still talking about the more secure strata of refugees, right? These are the individuals who are already inside the country, not the asylum seekers um, who are trying to receive um, a, a legal status. Um, but, but that was very challenging. And similarly with the, with the vets, I mean, some of the vets we interviewed were um, deported. You know, we had to set up Skype interviews long before we were all using Zoom um, to talk with deported vets as well as um, veterans who were inside the country. So there were a lot of very particular challenges, um, especially with with those groups um, whose stories I think are less frequently told. We have about 10 or 15 more minutes, but I think we're going to continue the conversation and incorporating some of the great questions that are emerging in the, in the chat. And I, and I wanted to keep going down this um, a little bit more, this area of methodology and the doing of the research that is required. And we had a great question um, from one of our university librarians that talks about kind of the, the changing political environment and what this means for the archive and you are in a not only, you know, currently political volatile moment, but just the ways in which we do research on a particular category of folks changes over time, right? And so this... Um this colleague talks about the ways in which even the recent change in language that we have seen reflected, you refer to this, but we've seen formal statements and formal policy change, but even just the language that we used to refer to in this case, illegal aliens, which for a long time has been the, 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 the term that the U.S. government has used to now undocumented immigrants. And I'm wondering... As these changes occur, how does this impact the way we construct an archive or construct categories of migrants over time, but also the kind of research that you're doing as a legal scholar and as a social scientist? And I think um, uh, Gerald Beasley is asking, you know, how would your research be affected by li libraries and the Library of Commerce, Congress kind of keeping up with the times and changing things like subject headings to um, keep up with this. And this is perhaps an esoteric question, but it's one that I, speaks, I think speaks to this broader issue of, of historical work and also trying to situate our own, for those you and I who are doing more presentist work, situate our work in the in the, um, in the long lineage of immigration policy making, immigration policy um, research that's happening. Do you have any thoughts on that in terms of how the, the archive kind of persists or, or becomes more challenging to trace over time? Sure. So I think if I were to kick that up in terms of one notch of, to kick that up a notch in terms of an abstraction, um, you know, something that I feel very strongly about um, is the use of mixed methods, um, including and especially qualitative methods like interviewing. Um, and I think that does help to get around some of the problems that would arise if I was solely focusing on government data um, or on quantitative data keeping. So like, for example, when I um, talked about the rising naturalization trend that kind of defies the longer trajectory of history, if I was just looking at the data points, I would know very little about what was happening to create that change, right? And it was only by talking with immigrants about their motivations for um, for wanting to naturalize and how those were changing and, and what they saw in the policy environment um, that was producing those changes, um, that I could start to interpret that quantitative data um, in a more meaningful way. So I think to the extent that um, it's possible to um, add those additional dimensions to be able to triangulate, I do think that that gives you a better understanding. Um, I mean, my interviews were still pretty structured. I mean, I did use coding software, um, and I suppose the, the codes would be off um, if the language changed dramatically, although certainly there are ways that you can search for multiple terms and to be able to combine them. 
Um, but, it, but I do think that is just one example of how qualitative data can help. Um, specifically um, with archives, um, I do think that this is another um, instance of where you need um, to have the kind of thick interpretation um, that, again, exceeds the, the counting of things. You know, again, not that that is not of some value, um, but I think it is of more value when it is contextualized um, historically as, as well as socially. And you can't do everything in one book. Um, there was a piece of this where I was like, oh, I should be writing about these dynamics in multiple slices of history um, and, and in multiple stages of people's lives. Like it would have been really neat to do a longitudinal study um, of an immigrant you know, in, in, like in that chart that I showed you, first arriving in the United States, getting the green card, getting the um, citizenship. Um, but that was too much to take on in one single book. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, I think um, being able to think broadly um, and, and to know those histories, even if they're not presented in the book itself, I think um, is potentially very helpful. Right. And I think in addition to um, language changing, you know, terminology changing and policies changing, the actual bureaucracies in place are changing. So one of the things that, uh, for example, my students talked about this week is the fact that the Immigration and Naturalization Service was once housed in the Department of Labor and you know, later moved to the Department of Justice. And even in the last two decades, you talk about this shift from um, the Immigration and Naturalization Service post 9-11 to then the Department of Homeland Security. And now we see calls to abolish ICE, the Immigration Customs of Enforcement. And I just wondered, you know, given what we know about the pre its predecessor, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, which carried out many of the same functions, even if in a different bureaucratic form than, um, than the current um, ICE and DHS setup, um, it still lacked the same integration functions that you are really calling for and which you suggest we desperately need to invest in, not only at the federal, but at the local level. So I wondered if we can say more about, you know, what is needed to shift this enforcement bias um, short of, I think, what we also need to think of, which is engaging the, you know, the carceral state and the broader questions even beyond immigration. But if we're really going to make some strides in immigrant well-being as a national priority beyond shifting policies and bureaucracies, which I think will be part of that um, process. What else would you suggest um, is needed to, to move out of this focus on enforcement into integration and well-being? Well, I mean, to pick up with the last question, this is one of those moments where history is very helpful um, because it does help you to see the path dependence, you know, that, that we've gone on where, um, you know, the enforcement functions have moved further and further um, into the national security and the security state. Right. Um, that there were alternative pathways that um, the Jordan Commission, among other things, um, at the same time, were considering whether um, immigrant benefits should be housed in the State Department. Um, because a lot of the visas that are issued um, are either similar or connected to the issuance of visas within the United States. Um, so thinking about that as an alternative possibility, I think, is a very interesting one. Um, I mean, I, I think another thing I would say is that um, I think another thing I would say is that in thinking about um, how you deal with the, um, I suppose, the interlocking pieces about um, the immigrant experience. One proposal that has been talked about a lot, it was talked about at the end of the Obama administration, I know it's been talked about among immigration advocates, um, is being able to have more interagency collaboration, um, either through informal working groups um, or through the creation of a White House office that would oversee many different agencies who are working on different aspects of immigration. Um, and so I was looking for it in the, um, the Biden bill, as you said, um, the closest I saw was some kind of a citizenship foundation, um, but it looks like that would still be housed in the USCIS. Um, alternatively, in, in a piece of legislation that is um, also re-emerging, um, the New Deal for New Americans, um, there is uh, centrally this idea of the, the creation of a White House office. Um, and I think there's some promise there. I mean, again, there's going to have to be a partnership um, in order to see this vision um, implemented within agencies. Um, but I think having that verse, that dexterity um, to be able to um, have somebody who is seeing the whole picture um, and then able to coordinate the economic activities and the public health activities um, and the um, national security 
um, and, and other dimensions, um, the discrimination um, components of being an immigrant, um, I, I think that would be of value um, so that things are not slipping in the, through the cracks and that one side is not swallowing up another. Right. A lot of the work that I do on labor standards enforcement talks about this need to do more interagency collaboration, even in one particular arena of, you know, low wage workers. But then a lot of the other work I do also, I mean, which you do also is, is skeptical about what that interagency um, collaboration looks like if there are anti-immigrant actors at play. And so the MOUs, the Memorandum of Understanding between the Department of Labor and the Department of Homeland Security are meant as a way to try to shield um, the, the impact of immigration enforcement on other rights arenas. We also know that um, DACA and TPS recipients have been nervous about, you know, what will be done with their data. And we know that the IRS and the Social Security Administration shares data all the time, which feed into the enforcement arena. And so I think this is a really important point that we have to be able to cooperate not only within the federal government, but also up and down the line with states and localities. But then we have all these other examples of interagency collaboration, 287G, et cetera, the the list goes on, that um, can make us nervous about this. But um, I think it'll be really interesting to see how do we re-envision the possibilities for those collaborations and the distribution of funds in a way that is, um, you know, not not so focused on enforcement and how do we continue to protect uh, this ethos even as the political winds change, yeah. And so I, I look forward to that conversation. Um, I want to end, we have about, uh, you know, three to five minutes left with looking to the next election. I know we've all kind of settled in <laughs> uh, to our, what, almost two months of, of, of breathing. Um, but as we settle into the current administration, we know that parties and candidates are already gearing up for the next round. And what will likely follow, especially as we've seen in, in your work in Colorado and in other places, are these typical um, pushes towards naturalization drives and get out the vote campaigns. And I just wondered for those listening in with an eye towards the political sphere, what insights you might offer um, if we want to have lasting impacts for immigrant communities rather than simply just instrumental focus on a particular election or a particular campaign. The labor movement also is, is guilty of some of this kind of narrow um, focus. And so what, what can we learn about the ways in which we can get, um, make use of these energizing moments, but at the same time, think long-term for the um, dynamics that you're talking about in your book? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that um, you know, there's a lot that happened in the last election um, that makes you feel like our, our system fell apart. But there were some stories, um, some success stories within them. Um, and I think one of them is that the turnout of a lot of the foreign born communities, um, Asian Americans, Latinos, um, was at historic high. Um, and we saw that that made a difference. You know, um, in, in places like Georgia, you know, which of course was very closely watched to the very, very end, um, the mobilization of Latino voters um, and Asian Americans um, mattered greatly. And then within the Asian American population, the movement of Vietnamese and Hmong groups um, to closer to the Democratic side also um made a difference in terms of the eventual electoral outcome. So I do think one of the big success stories is a mobilization story. Um, and, you know, if, if this isn't too, um, you know, self-serving, I think that the image of the spectrum of citizenship that I talk about in the book, um, I think is a useful one. Um, you know, we talk about pipelines to college. There are pipelines to being voters, Right. If you're an immigrant, you do have to go all the way down that spectrum um, from having a um, temporary status to a permanent status to naturalizing to be, to registering in many places and then becoming a voter. Right. So I think there do need to be protections um, at every stage of that pipeline. Um, and I think there was a lot of promising work done there. Um, but, you know, that work is already beginning um, for the elections that will come in two and four years. Um, you know, things like the census, too. I think things that seem very technical, um, I think, can't be forgotten. And, um, you know, we we won't have time to talk about it here, but um, there, there are two articles that I'm working on um, that are two halves of um, 
a project called The Political Misrepresentation of Immigrants. Um, a piece of it will come out with the NYU Law Review. The other one will come out with the Colorado Law Review. Um, one deals with voting and one deals with the census. Um, and in some ways, it feels far removed to talk about voting and immigrants in the same sentence. Um, but again, I think they're connected along that, that pipeline. Well, thank you so much, Ming. Um, this has been an incredible conversation, and I hope just the start for um, folks who are interested in finding out more about your work, there's a lot more to, to read and to hear. I also commend to you a, a recent TEDx talk that Ming did um, with the, um, the, the group out in Denver, a very accessible and really timely conversation around some of these themes. And so I welcome everyone to continue the conversation in whatever circle you're in and to attend our next um, migration speaker series, which you can find information on our website. Thank you. Thank you so much. And